Damari McGill has gained international recognition as a soloist, recitalist, chamber musician, and orchestral musician. Winner of an Avery Fisher Career Grant and the Sphinx Medal of Excellence, he has appeared as soloist with the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Seattle, Pittsburgh, Dallas, San Diego, and Baltimore Symphony Orchestras, and at age 15 with the Chicago Symphony. Today, he's principal flute of the Seattle Symphony. Damari is also a founding member of the Myriad Trio and the McGill-McHale Trio. A native of Chicago, Damari began studying flute at the age of seven, working with Susan Leviton. He received a Bachelor of Music degree from the Curtis Institute of Music and a Master of Music degree from the Juilliard School. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Just finished a semester of, you know, there was, um, there are a lot of silver linings. Um, never been in front of a computer so much in my life. <laughs> but, uh, good. I don't know if I've told you this. Every time I think of you, I think of a funny thing that happened at a concert of yours. You were performing at, uh, in Reston, Virginia at a National Flute Association thing. And you, mm -hmm. at the end of the concert, you, you played an encore that was an absolutely beautiful spiritual. I think it might have been Deep River. I can't recall. Mm -hmm. And when you were done, there was wild applause. But my friend and I were sitting there, and the person behind us said, that was definitely Chopin. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I'll tell you what popped in my mind when you when you brought this up. I didn't know what you were going to say. And I was playing in um, the National Gallery of Art in DC. And <laughs> Oh my goodness. And everything was going pretty well. I was tired because I had just flown in and everything, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and was playing the pool length sonata. First movement went by, second movement went by, and holding the high F. Mm -hmm. And I played it before with the pianos, you know, the high F. <laughs> by myself. <laughs> That feeling of emptiness was like, oh my goodness, like, and then, but the thing is, he didn't even like continue. I mean, I played that note and there was just silence afterwards because he was still turning his page. Oh no. And I really gave it all I had, you know? <laughs> Why did you choose to play the flute? So I started playing the flute um, because there was a flute in the house. When my, my parents were dating, they would have parties and they would have jam sessions. My mother would sing and my father would play an African wooden flute. And before they were married, my mother bought my father a, a metal instrument and some books. And so he dabbled just for fun. And when I was seven, I found that instrument and the books collecting dust in the closet and you know I brought it down like daddy daddy like how do you do this <laughs> how do you do this like uh he said well you put it together like this and you blow across it like you blow across a coke bottle and actually even that you can call that the first lesson I think that kind of uh triggered something in me like the way that I would learn you know, from that point on, you know, because he didn't really make a big deal out of, out of it. You know, it's just, he didn't say, well, it's, this is difficult and then you have to do this and you have to do this. I mean, he connected it to something that was familiar. There wasn't any, like, a necessary wall put up between me and being able to produce a sound. He blew across it like he blew across a Coke bottle. My private teacher growing up in Chicago, Susan Leventon, 
has an amazing, amazing private studio, uh, really, uh, my life would not have been possible with without um, her. She really did a wonderful job of of helping her students find a, a really productive routine uh, to build a really strong foundation and to know the to figure out the best way to think about how to create what would be your if you're going into music your professional path and she was a teacher that she, i mean she was right there with you every every note every measure sitting sitting right there i mean it was i probably without that um or i could say with that i was prepared for the learning environment that that I was fortunate enough to be to be in it with Jeffy Kaner and Julius Baker. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I just clearly remember more musical life lessons okay. than this exercise and that. Yes, we worked out of Top and Uncle Bear, but she had a way of creating kind of healthy competition without it souring personal relationships within the studio. But I remember one lesson when she said, do you know that, um, did you know that such and such, you know, practices this many hours a day? I said, oh, is that right? I, well, it was a legitimate thing to bring up because I didn't know that people practice that much, <laughs> you know? So then I practiced that much. It was really simple. So things like that, those are the things that I remember oh, yeah. that, and those are the things that really I know influence how I approach my life and how I approach music. From Jeff Kaner, just once again, just discipline, finding that routine. One thing I remember from Kaner was when I first got into Curtis, he just said, okay, you need to be working on, you know, a million etudes a week. Okay, maybe a million is an exaggeration, but a whole lot of etudes a week. But what we actually worked on in the lessons was repertoire. So for me, that was that expectation worked for me because it it forced me to think like a I guess you could say like a grown up musician. I like to teach myself even at that point, and maybe I don't know. Maybe they sensed that they really wanted a performance level each week. One lesson stands up, stands out over all of the others with Jeff Kaner. I was scheduled to play a, uh, a round for the Concer Philadelphia Orchestra Concerto Competition. And when I show up to the lesson, uh, sort of prepared, lukewarm, you know, <laughs> depending on <laughs> your expectations, it could have gone okay or I'm not prepared. But this is this is Jeff Kaner talk we're talking about. And um and he let me have it. I was torn to pieces, but he was right. Uh with Mr. Baker, um, uh, same thing. I still use I use his his method book, his the Julius Baker studies. My students use use that book, but every lesson was a performance and needed to be. For me, it it worked. It get it prepared me for musical adulthood. That expectation. I've heard actually that, um, that Julius Baker taught a lot by example, sort of like the Belcanto school of singing, where he would play and someone would then sort of play it back is that the way <laughs> was that your experience too the one thing that I, I always remember with mr baker is that he would he never said to me okay listen to me he would always say watch me you know watch my fingers just watch me like he every single time he's like watch me he didn't say you know do this with your mouth do this you know head up he just said watch me really from my perspective it was enough if you really watched them. There's there's so much information in there that would be hard to to verbalize. 
mean, because it's more than just do this one thing. He had a sort of a, a natural coordination, so maybe that's why it was so helpful to just watch him. You can't really teach somebody how to walk. It was exactly that. Like, um, I remember his armature. I remember how his fingers looked. Um, I remember how he how he moved when he when he played in coordination with the music with the phrase. Um, I remember his use of vibrato, uh, in particular, uh, that I, just the way he moved, and he actually did talk about this, is that you could see and hear the bow changes. Oh. You know, I remember one time he played a recording that he had just made, and yeah, he was bowing along when he was listening to himself. And, and he specifically brought it up that this is, <laughs> that's what he's going for. He demonstrated, especially when I was fortunate enough to, to study with him, to go to his home in Brewster, New York, because he was, he was like 10 years younger at home. And he played even, he played even more at home. You know, I remember when I was working on or orchestra excerpts at his home and listening to him play Firebird and just, yeah, once again, I, he never s said anything. Just, you know, just watch me. If you're paying attention there, that's everything that you needed. Yeah. If you're paying attention and it just speaks to his level of artistry that that was enough. Could you maybe talk about your journey to the Seattle Symphony and how you got there? When I was in school, for some reason, I didn't actually work on a lot of orchestra excerpts. I didn't. It was when I studied with, with Mr. Baker at Juilliard. I had been fortunate enough to have some nice gigs, a few. Not enough to, to, not enough to string together to make a living. But you need more than one of those. You need, you know, to, to really live. He said, you know, how old are you? And I told him how, however old I was. And he said, well, um, basically, your time is almost done playing these concertos with these orchestras right now. Because uh, you're of the age now where either you're going to, they're going to give these opportunities to James Galway or the principal flutist of the orchestra. I'm so grateful he said something. If you want to continue, if you want more of those opportunities, it would be easier for you to get those if you um, were able to get an orchestra job. It's this culture that I just was un I wasn't aware of. Um, but Kaner made me realize that. So then I started to audition miserably. <laughs> Not, I mean, I I wasn't miserable. I mean, I. Yeah, actually miserably, you know, just it was it was oh, such it's such a crazy process and wasn't getting anywhere. I got my first job with the Florida Orchestra. I was in heaven. I was so happy to get a paycheck making music. I just could not believe it. I spent a, I spent four years there, moved on to the San Diego Symphony, um, had a one year as acting principal in the Pittsburgh Symphony when Langevin moved to New York. Uh, went back to San Diego after that, got the job in Seattle, and then went to the Dallas Symphony. Was there for three years, won in a, a private audition for a one-year spot with the Metropolitan Opera when Dennis, Dennis Broyakov went to LA. Fortunately, there were some auditions that year. Uh, Seattle, my previous job, I had been gone for four years at that point, was one of them I, in re-audition. Um, after the year at the Met. And yeah, so that's my route to the Seattle Symphonies. The orchestra was playing uh, since September for um, just live streaming 
the concert, it's re they really found, I mean, it, it's been working for them. Um, they've been, uh, you have to get a, you can pay per concert, like a ticket, or you have to get subscriptions, but people have been actually um, tuning in and, and paying for it. I'm, I'm really happy that they, they take a chance yeah. with with this because there's a lot of organizations, as you may know, who just threw in a towel right. and just said nothing until see you, see you next year. But um, I'm happy that they didn't do that, and it actually worked out. That there's been you know some people hungry for live music that have been tuning in because they've gotten a kick out of like one second they can hear this orchestra, another you know an hour later they're in this city. talk a little bit about the the take two knees project i participated oh. in in a hashtag take two knees initiative that was uh created by my brother anthony mcgill it's during a time uh that all of us will remember and hopefully all of our aims goals and in, in lives will be changed hopefully for the better in that even though the idea of injustices towards the black community um by uh, the police not all police but just speaking as a whole um is something that a lot of black people are aware of i mean i've known it since i was young I've seen it since I was young. And if you haven't, then I can understand it may be difficult to even, no matter how much you see it on television, difficult to understand it's really systemic. But it's a part of my existence. It doesn't shield you just because you're in classical music. After the, the killing of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there are just two in a long, long list. Um, he wanted to do something and he woke up and decided this is my way of raising awareness in the field that I love. And so I went, I immediately was like put something together and um, was one of the, the first people, early people to, to do that. But um, I can't take any credit other than supporting my brother's, my brother's initiative, really. Great to see you. Good to see you. Okay. Yeah. Right. Take well, care. Bye-bye. We'll take care.